The nation of the Welsh was conceived on the deathbed of the Roman Empire. It was born in the excitement of the Age of Saints, but its infancy was meagre and lonely, yet, as it shall be seen, it would have an exhilarating adolescence. Now the Age of Saints is over in Wales, and we enter the late 7th century towards the 8th century. The kingdoms of Wales would experience their greatest challenges yet, as the English Kingdom of Mercia would reach its zenith of power, threatening the kingdoms in Wales of Gwenith, Powys and Gwent. And a new source material would emerge, the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, consisting of various annals compiled together, giving us another source to try and understand what was happening in Albion. But before we look at the conflicts involving the Welsh and the Mercians, let's check up on some of the other kingdoms of Wales and their history in the late 7th century. The Kingdom of Gwent. This kingdom is often tied with the Kingdom of Glowissing, due to the local royal dynasty being relatives. Information on this kingdom in the 7th century is scarce, but we do have a record of a climactic fight with the English in 630 AD where King Taldric led the Welsh to victory at the cost of his life. John Davis mentions this in his History of Wales. According to tradition, the men of Gwent defeated the English in about 630 AD, a victory which thwarted English attempts to gain control of the northern coastlines of the Severn Sea. Their victory was among the most important events in the history of Wales. But despite this epic battle we don't know much about, archaeological evidence tells us that trade was alive and well between the kingdoms of the English and the Welsh kingdoms. A research framework for the archaeology of Wales states that fragmentary Anglo-Saxon objects from Dinas Powys and Dinorban imply some sort of contact and or trading with the Anglo-Saxon world. The apparent concentration of Anglo-Saxon metalwork in the southeast of Wales illustrates the wider cultural landscape for the Dinis Powage assemblage, and the diffusion of objects from England from the 6th century if not earlier. Such finds may reflect the influence and political liaisons of kings of southeast Wales and the dynasty of the Kingdom of Gwent with the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms during this period. The Kingdom of Dovid, the kingdom in which St. David was active around for most of his life in the early to late 6th century, but moving into the 7th century, there isn't much information regarding what was happening in Dovid. A king of Dovid married the sole princess of Brocaniog, which gained him the throne of the kingdom, giving him a substantial amount of authority in South Wales. And in the Annuals of Wales, a source dated around the 10th century states in 645 the hammering of the region of Dovid when the monastery of David was burnt. We don't know the identity of the attackers. The Kingdom of Ceredigion. For this period in the history of the kingdom, we only have names of the kings, although one king invaded and annexed parts of Dovid around the late to early 8th century, greatly expanding the kingdom. The Kingdom of Gwenith. We've already covered a few kings from this kingdom, most notably Cadwallon and his campaigns, but by the time of Cadwallon's death, the kingdom was severely weakened, as his eventual successor, Cadarvile, is deemed a weak king, and is referred to as a low-born king, and due to this weakness, Gwenith was now on a weaker footing in terms of the power dynamic between Gwenith and Mercia, under Penda, who carried on his war with the Northumbrians. Cadarvile only managed to secure the throne, as Cadwallon's son was too young to rule. But Cadarvile's fate was tied with Penda, who would later die at the Battle of Winwade in 655. He is reported to either have abandoned Penda or watched the battle from afar awaiting the outcome. Regardless of the actions taken, Cadwallon's son, Cadwallader Ap Cadwallon, took charge of Gwyneth. His kingship is considered on par with his father's, given the length of his reign, although his kingdom experienced two great plague outbreaks, perhaps a resurgence of the plague of Justinian. The Annals of Wales record Cadwallader's death, 
682 AD, a great plague in Britain, in which Cadwallader, son of Cadwallan of Gwyneth, dies. Cadwallader is known for his association with the national flag of Wales, the Red Dragon. Although we're not sure when the flag or symbol was first used, perhaps during the Roman occupation of Britain, we don't have a definitive answer. Cadwallader's history is tied up with the pseudo-history of Geoffrey of Monmouth. As for his actual history, there isn't much. Looking at the Annals of Wales in the 680s, several horrible events took place. In 683, a plague in Ireland. In 684, a great earthquake in the Isle of Man. And in 689, to quote the annuals, the rain turned to blood in Britain. And in Ireland, milk and butter turned to blood. As for Gwyneth, their next two kings ruled the kingdom for quite some time, but we only have their names, nothing about their rule or what was happening in the kingdom at the time. The Kingdom of Powys We've already covered one major event the Kingdom of Powys was involved in, in either 613 or 616, the Battle of Chester, where the King of Powys was slain. With this defeat, the kingdom was split in two, as a king from a sub-kingdom took over the northern parts of Powys. A sub-kingdom in Wales was a minor kingdom under the authority of a larger kingdom. Gwyneth had quite a few sub-kingdoms under its authority. Powys would eventually be whole again in the early 8th century. However, before its reunification, the kingdom would lose territory to the English kingdoms. A king of southern or northern Powys and the overlord of the sub-kingdom of Penguin fought alongside King Penda of Mercia, but after Penda's defeat and death, the Powys king is thought to have met his end at the same battle as Penda, although another tale has him defending and dying to protect the sub-kingdom of Pendwen, which would eventually be attacked and destroyed by the resurgent kingdom of Northumbria. Poems written in the later centuries tell us the suffering Powys endured, as well as the complete destruction of the sub-kingdom. Germanic settlers would colonise this area, known in our time as Shrewsbury, yet the Welsh would launch efforts to retake this land, leading to the construction of a dyke, a fortified earthwork. But before we look into the creation of the earthworks, there is one final kingdom's history we need to cover beforehand. The Kingdom of Mercia we will just give a quick summary of the kingdom, as the focus of this video is on Offa and the Welsh. Mercia's earliest history is the tale of legends, with a legendary king establishing the kingdom around the 6th century. The kingdom's capital is a town called Tamworth, and like kingdoms in Wales, Mercia had its own sub-kingdoms, which, over time, would be annexed and incorporated into Mercia. The years of 716 to 825 was the height of Mercian power. King Penda of Mercia set the course for the kingdom supremacy. With his defeat and death, the kingdom went through a brief period of instability. But its power was soon back and grew even stronger under successive sons of Penda until we get to perhaps the most famous king of Mercia, Offa. Offa acquired the throne of Mercia after a brief conflict with a thane who had taken the throne after the murder of the previous king. To demonstrate the power Offa could wield in the height of his reign, the Anglo-Saxon chronicles tell us that in 794, in this year, King Offa, king of the Mercians, ordered King Ethelbert's head to be struck off. He was the king of the East Angles. A testament to Offa's prestige is that Charlemagne, king of the Franks and the first Holy Roman Emperor, wrote to Offa in 796, calling him his dearest brother and to be a most strong protector of your earthly country. King Offa's most enduring legacy is the Offa's Dyke, a huge set of earthworks 
stretching from the north of the border of Wales and down to the south. King Offa's Dyke is the largest and longest one in Britain, but it is not the only one in Britain. The Offa's Dyke Association gives this description. Offa's Dyke is a linear earthwork which roughly follows the Welsh-English boundary. It consists of a ditch and rampart constructed with the ditch on the Welsh facing side and appears to have been carefully aligned to present an open view into Wales from along its length. As originally constructed, it must have been about 27 metres wide and 8 metres from the ditch bottom to the bank top. The construction and origins of Offa's Dyke are obscure. Various theories are offered to us. One is that the dyke was constructed to protect Mercia from renewed Welsh Kingdom attacks, as Powys had regained its strength and challenged the English at Hereford along with other Welsh Kingdoms, as the Annals of Wales state, a battle between the Britons and the Saxons, that is, the Battle of Hereford. We don't know which Welsh king led the armies, some sources say the King of Powys, while others are ambiguous about the leader of the army. Regardless, the Mercians may have initially built Watts Dyke, which is a smaller dyke going from the north of Wales down to Shropshire. However, the origins of this dyke are also debatable, as parts of the dyke have been carbon dated to the early 9th century. But back to Offa's Dyke's origins, there is a suggestion that the dyke was built as a physical border between his kingdom and the Welsh kingdoms. The first recorded mention of the dyke in Chronicles is from a Welsh monk called Asa, who was the biographer of Alfred the Great. He states that the dyke went from sea to sea. The construction of such a grand earthworks would have taken years and would have required a massive amount of manpower. Parts of the dyke that were already under construction must have needed protection, as if the dyke was to be made without the consent of the Welsh kingdoms, they most likely would have tried to stop it from being built, as the design was such that Mercia could look far into the Welsh territories. How long the dyke took to build we don't know, and or if it incorporated existing earthworks from Roman Britain. More archaeological research is needed, but during the heyday of the dyke, it most certainly was used to look into Wales, and we have records of Offa raiding parts of Wales in 778, the devastation of the South Britons by Offa, 784, the devastation of Britain by Offa in the summer. In terms of the Welsh Kingdom's relationship with Offa, they were mixed at best. However, in regards to the construction of the dyke, the Welsh Kingdom's bordering Mercia, Gwent and Powys, may have worked with the Mercians in setting the boundaries for the dyke. John Davies, A History of Wales, tells us that there was a degree of consultation with the kings of Powys and Gwent on the long mountains near Trelleston. The dyke veers to the east, leaving the fertile slopes in the hands of the Welsh. He then further states on Gwent's borders. There is no more obvious boundary in the whole of Britain than the gorge of the Lower Wye, but assuming that the dyke in that region is part of Offa's project, his men went to the trouble of building the dyke on the crest to the east of the gorge, clearly with the intention of recognising that the River Wye and its traffic belong to the Kingdom of Gwent. Walking along this part of the dyke, it's clear that it would be easy for the Mercians to look deep into Gwent's territories, and as the river makes easy natural boundaries, it made sense to build the dyke on the Mercian side of the border, then trying to infringe and construct it on Gwent's territory. King Offa died in 796, three years after the attack on Linden Farm, and although the Welsh kingdoms would still have to contend with Mercia, a new threat arrived that would change the kingdoms of Britain and Ireland, the Vikings.